The expertise and commitment of those people was tested to the extreme when Lean headed into the deserts of the Middle East in 1961 on, to shoot Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, the man torn between two civilizations. The picture was a nightmare. Lawrence of Arabia took 12 months to shoot, one year exactly to shoot the entire picture. It's an enormous shooting time. But we shot in Jordan, we shot in Morocco and in Spain. And there was no accommodation. We built a huge camp, a camp for the studio and a camp for all the workshops and a camp for the crew and a camp for the restaurant. And everything all built by intent. Terribly tough job. So tough that David used to fall asleep, as far as I know. I mean, we, we couldn't even have meetings in the evening because the work was so heavy. I mean, all those people that you saw on that call sheet, that sort of thing, in intense heat, with you being the director totally responsible for everything, with all these assistants. I mean, he was in no mood to socialise or, or do anything. And it was the desert. I mean, it was the dreary, boring, lovely... But sand, 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 and wind, nothing else. I'll never forget being in the desert and living in a caravan out there in this enormous great place, miles away from anywhere. When he was directing on the set, he, he used to like it to be quite quiet. He didn't like a lot of noise, and so people used to speak in hushed tones. And he, he, he used to think things through very carefully and almost ponderously, in a way, before he shot a scene. Lean's need to think things through was sometimes at odds with the practicalities of shooting, as cinematographer Freddie Young would find out to his cost. On Lawrence Arabia, a lot of the sequences were so complex that they were pre-set up by John Box, the art director, and myself. It was to be shot at magic hour. That is the time when it's neither day or night. And you only get about three or four cracks at it. One is always too early, one is too late, and the middle one is usually just right. Anyway, we set this scene up. David arrived with the main crew. He looked at it. He didn't say anything. He just looked at the camera. And I said, well, this, this should be right about 6 or 6.30, I think, David. All right, he said. And he went and sat down. Now. The cameraman, of course, was Freddie Young. So after about 50 minutes, he said, David, I think we'd better go. It's getting, you know, time in March, and we'd better try the first shot at it. And David wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't budge. He just sat in his chair. Uh, he, just, he wasn't talking. And um, another 10 minutes went by, and Freddie urged him once more. He said, David, it's, it's not now or never, but very soon it'll be too late. And with that, David got up, he grabbed my arm, and I won't tell you what he said because it's, this, is a, this is a public broadcast show, but it was completely horrible. I mean, he went absolutely shouted at Freddie and rushed me off with his jeep, and, uh, and that was the end of the shooting for today. He never did the shot, and uh, he wouldn't speak to Freddie for about a couple of days, and it was very awkward, very embarrassing. And I went off with my unit to do some other work, and a couple of days later, I spoke to Ernie, Ernie Day, the camera operator on Freddie's unit. I said, did you do that shot that, that I set up? He said, oh, yes, he said, we, we shot it. I said, well, what did he do that was different? He said, nothing. I said, well, what was it, what did he, why did he shoot it when we did it the first time? He said, I don't know at all. Whether he saw something in the light or something that displeased him, he never said, but that's how he was. What was he really like, this controversial figure who became a legend in his own lifetime? Despite the sheer scale of the production, Lean's attention to detail would not be compromised. I'll give an instance of how meticulous David was. We had two armoured Rolls Royces on Lawrence of Arabia, and one of them had to come in through a low camera before the scene opened and stop with the wheel in camera. And he insisted that that stopped with the RR on the wheel disc was the right way up when it stopped. It wasn't easy to do. <laughs> A desert railway track explodes and horses are freed from weapons. Lawrence and Lorraine, together they made history. Perfection may have been Lean's aim, but he was rarely satisfied by his own work. 
David said, you know, had I seen Lawrence? And I said, yeah, about seven or eight times, David. What do you think? Oh, I thought it was superb, fantastic, wonderful. What did you think about it when you saw it, David? And he thought for a couple of seconds, and he said, you know, Mike, I could have done it better. Well, how much better could you do Lawrence of Arabia? The dedicated maniac who had captured the images in Lawrence so perfectly was the late Freddie Young, who went on to win three Oscars with Lean. Lighting cameraman on the film has many responsibilities. He has to uh, not only light, but uh, have a, a good artistic understanding of composition. Well, I worked with him on three pictures, Lawrence Arabia and Dr. Zhivago and this present one. So I knew David years before. In fact, as a young man, he edited quite a number of my pictures. He's a hard taskmaster, you know, to all concerned. But if you're enthusiastic and you don't mind hard work, uh, well, then you just get on fine. Freddie understood him. Freddie understood exactly what David wanted, the same as I did. He was a wonderful man, Fred Young, wonderful cameraman. Between the two of them, they were brilliant at making pictures. Metro Goldwyn Mayer presents David Lean's film of Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago. Freddie had become an integral part of David's team, so when he was unavailable for Dr. Zhivago, his replacement had a lot to live up to. We built a big street right all the way up to the Kremlin. And it's the first night shooting, first night, the beginning of the film. And we had a cameraman on. He took all night to light the set, all night. It was nearly dawn and David was really getting upset. He suddenly put on some front light and all the snow and everything else disappeared, of course. He said, I can't stand any longer. I can't stand him, he's got to go. And I don't care if we got, Freddie Young was out in Khartoum or somewhere. He said, I'm not going to do it until I get Freddie Young. And get him back, he did. Ryan's daughter was to prove another test of the team's dedication. This time it wasn't just a set, but an entire village with cobble streets and running water that was built in Ireland. With attention to detail like that, it was little wonder that the shoot would drag on over two winters. Some <laughs> terrible journalist came to me and said rather earnestly, Mr. Lean, is it true you wait five weeks for a wave? Okay. For actors like Robert Mitchum, that's exactly what it looked like. Action. David always relied on us, assistant directors, to look after the actors and even, you know, sometimes socialise with them. He would say to me which ones he thought were difficult and how was I going to handle it. And I said, well, I'll let you know when, I, when I've handled it, I guess, David. When you're offered a film, you're said to look at the contract to see how many days you get off. Not the contract, look at the script. See how many days off I get. Was this a good script from that point of view? It was, but I was led down the garden path, you see. When I'm not working, I'm standing by. I'm under house arrest. But, you know, as I said to Robert Mitchell, and he knew better because he'd been in Ireland before, I said, you know, Robert, the weather, you know what it's like, we've got to hang around. Suddenly, you know, Teddy Bob, David's looking at the clouds. I said, yeah, of course he's looking at the clouds. <laughs> There's plenty of them. David had never shot in Ireland. And I told him the weather's going to change from one hour to the next. Terrible weather. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. It was getting dark, of course, in that winter in Ireland. And uh, he, we'd chained a caravan down for him in a lee, a lee behind some high, high, high ground. And he and I and Freddie Young were in there taking off the wetsuits. And David said, how are we going to finish the beach scenes, which I haven't finished all yet? I said, well, I've seen some good pictures of beaches in South Africa. He said, well, when can you go to South Africa? I said, when you say. He said, now, three days later, I was back. And he said to me, I thought you were going to go to South Africa. And I said, I've been to South Africa, David, and uh, I'd bought a little plastic bag and I tipped the sand out. And I said, there's the sand for Freddie Young to save the colour or match. And he said, what do you think? And I went on it. Eddie crosses his fingers. And I said, 
I think pack it all up, put it on an aeroplane, and we'll go down and finish the picture. He said, you're the only one that ever says to me, we'll do it that way. And I agree. <laughs> I can't help wondering if you had been brought up at a time before the advent of the cinema, what would you have been? I think probably a complete dud. Most people only saw the hard man behind the camera. Don't worry about the back. But when not at work, Lean's maniacs encountered a different side to him. David, privately, was nothing like I've described him as being a tough guy of making his movie, but that was all because he wanted his movie made his way. But he was different off stage. He had the greenest fingers. In fact, he was so keen on gardening that Kay Walsh, when they were married, for his birthday, bought him a huge lorry load of manure. That was his birthday present. After work, sometimes, socially, he was very funny and very, very good fun to be with, and he could enjoy himself. It's a side of, his, of him that not many people knew because he didn't socialise a lot, and certainly very rarely with the artists. We'd go to the cinema in Uxbridge, and David would say, I can't hear the sound, it needs turning up and he'd go and see the manager. The manager said, oh, so you don't understand, this is the way the... F he didn't know who David was. This is the way the film comes to us, we can't alter the sound. And David said, don't be silly, let me go up to the projection box and turn it up a few dBs or something, which he did. He liked good food, he, didn't, he wasn't a drinker, he didn't drink very much. He'd love to go to the Savoy, where they used to have a little orchestra, sort of like, he used to, like they used to have when he was a young man. And he used to get up there. And, and, and dance in the old-fashioned old sort of jiggery dances I used to do. He did like dancing, yes, he did, he did like dancing, that's quite right, he did like dancing. And in fact, I gave him a whole pile of LPs, which I brought out to, jungle, to the desert, which he never returned. <laughs> David was a different sort of chap off stage, a fellow kindness. At the end of Dr. Chivago, he gave me his Rolls Royce and bought himself another one. And he said, I think you'd look rather good in the Rolls Royce. <laughs> That's why I say you never knew whether it was hard on the outside, soft on the inside, or the other way round. So really, you go through phases of working with people for a period of time? Yes, or um, they get sick of working with me and I... Or you milk them dry? Yes, maybe I do, yes. I was a friend. I mean, a deep friend, a dear friend, uh, a professional friend. Um, I think he liked me very much, like I liked him, but we drifted apart. I last spoke to him when he was at the place in London where he'd bought the old warehouse, and he was preparing Nostromo. To my mind, no one had really ever filmed Joseph Conrad successfully. Wonderful read but almost untranslatable into the film. And I said, well, I do wish you luck on it, but I said, I'm personally apprehensive. He said, oh, don't worry, it'll be all right, and so forth. And uh, that's the last time we spoke. Then life changed for me, really. I lost a good friend there. Anyway, what it's done is left me with some wonderful memories, and I'm glad to have the chance to share a few of them with you. When it's all finished, the music's done, you've said goodbye to all the actors, it's a breaking up of a very warm little family, really, and the film is finished in a pile of cans, and you're on your own again. Next tonight here on BBC4, we find out how much it costs to get Richard Wilson to say a certain all-too-familiar catchphrase. Mark Lawson meets the respected actor and director at London's Royal Court Theatre in just a few moments. <laughs>